In this video, I will talk about how to design energy efficient 5G networks and when massive MIMO meets small cells. And my name is Emil Björnsson. I'm an associate professor at Linköping University in Sweden, and I've been working with MIMO and energy efficiency for a number of years now. And in particular, I'm the writer of the Massive MIMO blog. I have a number of different patent applications, and I have written a book called Massive MIMO Network Spectral Energy and Hardware Efficiency. And today I will talk about what is energy efficiency in general when it comes to wireless communications, potential solutions for higher energy efficiency in future networks, and finally give you a case study of how to design these networks where massive MIMO meets small cells. So let's start talking about wireless networks. This is what we call a cellular or mobile communication network where you have base stations that are serving the users that are in their vicinity. And as a user device, you connect to the closest base station, which is typically on a rooftop or on the big mast. And in this type of networks, the amount of data that is communicated increases by around 39% every year. And this is from the latest Ericsson Mobility report from June 2018, where they are showing the number of exabytes per month that are transmitted in cellular networks and it increases by this 39% every year. The yellow here is showing 4G, 3G and 2G systems. And starting from year 2020, they are expecting that some additional data will flow through 5G networks as well. And 39% annual increase, that's an exponential increase. And that has been going on for a long time. And with something like that, it means that going from 2017 to 2023, we will see a seven times more data traffic in the networks. And this is building up. If we go another six years, we'll have another factor seven. Video is and will even more become the dominant application that they use in this type of networks. And when we are building networks that are being able to deliver these seven times more data or maybe 50 times or much more than that over the course of the years. The question is what happens with the energy consumption in the network? Will this grow in the same way? Because what we're sending out is electromagnetic waves that carry energy or can we make 5G much more energy efficient so we can lower or at least keep the energy consumption the same as today? So, Let's start with the basics about energy efficiency. So what is that? Well, there is a benefit cost analysis that you can make in economics for all kinds of systems. In particular here, we apply it to cellular systems. So we have our cellular network. Our input is cost. In particular, we're interested in energy consumption here, measured in watt or joule per second. And at the output, we have the data throughput. That's our benefit and that's measured in bits per second. So we have something per second on both sides. And in order to measure how the benefits and the costs are balancing with, towards each other, it's very common to create a benefit cost ratio where we take the output, the data throughput, in, for example, in bits per second per square kilometer, if we are looking at a particular area or country, we divide with input, that's the energy consumption in joule per second per square kilometer. And the units here is telling us that second and second square kilometer and square kilometer cancel out and bit per joule is our unit. And this is what we call the energy efficiency. And this is something that we can uh, analyze in different types of ways. Some things to think about, environmental concerns. Well, the energy production is mainly non-renewable in most countries today. And that's one of the reasons why we would like to lower the energy consumption. Consuming energy in this network is not bad by itself unless the production is uh, causing environmental problems. And that is one of the reasons why we are talking about energy efficiency. Another thing has to do with economical costs because energy costs money. And also deploying these networks costs money. And we can, if we want to, include this at the cost part there as well, just multiply that with uh, a conversion factor between money and energy. So how does the energy efficiency look like in a system of today? 
I took the image on a nearby rooftop. What you see here is a standard base station of the type that you would expect. So it's one site and it has one base station pointing in different direction here. So there are three base stations in total. Each of them have a large panel and this is a dual polarized antenna panel that is covering 120 degrees. And with this type of technology, you typically have a data throughput of up to 28 megabit per second. It depends on what type of LT generation we're considering. In this case, I have borrowed a number from a very good paper called How Much Energy is Needed to Run a Wireless Network for 2011. Okay, so that's the throughput in a system like this over the entire site. Below here, you can see the power amplifiers. They are almost as large as the antennas themselves because a lot of energy is consumed at a site like this, both to uh, amplify and radiate out energy and to do all the baseband and analog processing that is needed. And the energy consumption of such a base station is, or were at year 2010, 1.35 kilowatt. If we now divide the data throughput with energy consumption, we get an energy efficiency. 28 megabit per second divided by 1.35 kilowatt. That becomes 20 kilobit per joule. So that is the energy efficiency baseline that we have in the system of today. And I will show you later that we can improve this by a lot, by orders of magnitude in future networks. So is 4G already becoming more energy efficient? Well, here's a statement from Ericsson Mobility Report from November 2015, where they say, while traffic in mobile network has grown tremendously over the last five few years, networks have become increasingly energy efficient. And what they are observing in that case is that we have had 13 times more traffic over a certain number of years, and energy consumption has only grown by 40%. But there is a catch with this requirement, and it's like this. As the traffic load has increased, we have gone from a rather high initial energy consumption to a slightly higher one in our 4G networks. While the energy efficiency for that reason have grown steadily as the traffic load has grown as well. The problem is that we want the energy consumption to be much more connected with the actual data traffic because where does all this initial cost come from when we don't have any traffic? Well, that's because we have built the system in the wrong way so that it consumes a lot of energy when there's no traffic and then just a little bit extra when there is traffic. So in the, what is desirable in the future is that energy consumption is lower all the time, but in particular when there is no load. So it will grow like this instead. And therefore, the energy efficiency will hopefully be roughly high all the time, irrespective of if we have many or few users, if we are in the middle of the day or in the night time. So, yes, 5G networks have become more energy efficient, but not in the way that we would like it to be. And therefore, we need to think more thoroughly how we can do this in 5G networks to become energy efficient in the desirable way. So how can we make a ratio like this between data throughput and energy consumption larger? Well, there are some different options. And there are non-trivial trade-offs here because we can play around with both of these throughput and energy consumption. We could let the data throughput grow while at the same time decreasing the energy consumption. Well, then the ratio will grow. We can let the data throughput decay, but the energy decay faster and then the ratio will also grow. Or we can let the data throughput grow and the energy also grow, but not at the same pace. And actually, it's the third one here that is the most likely solution for future networks because we need to deploy technology to uh, make it more efficient. And that's something we'll see later as well. So higher energy consumption is something that we actually, or unfortunately, will have to expect in future networks but also something that becomes much more energy efficient. There is no way that we can deliver 1,000 times more data, for example, without consuming at least a little bit more energy than today. 
So how can we improve the energy efficiency of future networks? Well, I will now go through a number of different ways that we can do that. The first potential solution is power control, meaning that we are controlling the transmit power that we're using. So consider a point-to-point -point transmission over here from a base station to a user device. And then the data throughput divided by energy consumption can, for example, be modeled in the following way. In the data throughput part, we had the bandwidth multiplied with the spectral efficiency. And the typical way is log 2 or 1 plus an SINR, signal to interference and noise ratio. And in the numerator, then, we have the transmit power times the path loss. And in the denominator, we have the noise variance, which is the bandwidth times the noise power spectral density. The energy consumption contains two parts. One has to do with the transmit power, so it's actual transmit power, but we divide with the amplifier efficiency because power amplifiers can be very inefficient. If you transmit with a certain rate, we might consume four times more power. And here is the circuit power consumption, which is taking care of all of the analog and digital circuits that are being used, and it's both for the radio and the baseband processing. So let's now have a look at how this behaves when we are changing the transmit power. So here is an example. I selected some parameters here. We have 10 megahertz, the amplifier efficiency 25%, and B divided by N naught divided by times lambda is 0 dBm. Here we see the energy efficiency in megabits per yule versus the transmit power. The first curve up here is when we neglect this circuit power term. And then the energy efficiency starts at the high point, marked with the star, or the star here is the maximum point, and then it goes down all the time. When we add circuit power of 0 0.1 watt, now the energy efficiency becomes much lower when we have low transmit power, but it grows up to a maximum point when it starts to go down again. And this is called unimodal function. So there is a transmit power that maximizes energy efficiency and we would like to control our system in such a way that we're operating close to that one. And as we increase the circuit power, the energy efficiency drops, but also the amount of power that we should use in order to be maximally energy efficient also grows. So that's an important thing. If the circuit power is large, we can afford paying more in terms of higher transmit power, and that will still behave better in more end efficient way. Eventually, they all go down, and that is because log 2 of the transmit power grows logarithmically, and the power term here grows linearly, so it will go down eventually. The important thing here is not the actual values here, but the general behaviors goes up and then down again due to the circuit power. And since that one determines a lot where the curves behaves, it's very important to model that one in a realistic way. Another potential solution is to play around with the density of the cells. When you put the base station here, depending on where you are, different distances from the base station, the data rate will vary a lot. And that is because of the path loss. So if you're close by, you might get the maximum rate. So I've cut off things here, but then after a while it goes down because now you have a much lower signal to noise ratio. And already at one meter distance, you only receive 0.001% of the transmitted power. At 10 meters, it's another factor 100 that goes away. And this is for free space propagation. In reality, it goes down even faster in non line of sight cases. So what is the insight from this? Well, if we can lower the distance between the transmitter and the receiver, we can also transmit with much less power but, or receive a much larger fraction of what we have transmitted. So if we have smaller cells, so we reduce the distances between transmitters and receiver, we have a lower loss and that can be used to reduce the power. So in a given square kilometer, we would like to go from one case with relatively large cells to smaller and smaller cells. And of course, there will be a trade-off in terms of energy consumption. 
because if you reduce the power in such a way that we are still transmitting the same, the data rate is the same all the time, well, the transmit power can go down because we lower the power, but the circuit power will go up because in each square kilometer we have many more cells. So we need to deploy more hardware. Another potential solution is what is called massive MIMO, where MIMO stands for multiple input, multiple output. And the idea here is that we would like to direct the signals from the base station towards the user or direct our listening in the uplink so that we are focusing on where the user is. So typically in a system of today, we have antenna panels with a wide beam they're covering a certain sector where the user is. And then for each sector, we can only have one user active at the same time of frequency. That is what happens when you have few antennas. But when you have a massive number of antennas, we can use them to direct the signals very narrowly to different users. We don't really need any sectorization anymore. We can just have a massive number of users being served at the same time, 10 in this example, for example. And by directing the signals, we have a higher received signal power. It's proportional to the number of antennas. So 10 times more antennas mean 10 times higher received signal power. But more importantly, we can also spatially multiplex users. So we can have many more users active at the same time within every cell. So more antennas means that we can cut down on the power to get the same performance per user because more power is actually received. And we can also multiplex several users. So the throughput will go up and there will also be a trade-off because the transmit power can go down but the circuit power will go up because we add more antennas and so we need more receiver chains and we need to spend more power in the digital baseband potentially to do the all the signal processing. So there's really no free lunch here. There is always a trade-off and we would like to design networks that finds the best trade-off. And that is really an energy efficiency optimization problem. So how do we find the most energy efficient network design? Well, the methodology that I would uh, propose is to select which are my network design variables. And so far, these are just a number of letters. These are the things I can play around with. We will see later what they actually represent. Then you model your data throughput and the energy consumption as functions of these variables as well as you can. And then you would like to solve an optimization problem. M maximize the data throughput as a function of these design variables divided by the energy consumptions also as a function of these variables with respect to those design variables. And here I'm just written them up, but of course there will be limitations on which values that are permissible in reality. This is a methodology that we proposed in a paper called Optimal Design of Energy Efficient Multi-Use MIMO System is Massive MIMO the Answer, which received the 2018 Marconi Prize Paper Award in Wireless Communications. And since that one, we have written a number of follow-up papers on this topic as well. And the case study that I will describe in this video is related to the second paper here from Deploying Dense Network for Maximal Energy Efficiency, Small Cells Meet Massive MIMO. So here is the case study. I would like to do network optimization and in order to, to play around with the dense their base station, we need to figure out how our base stations actually distribute in real systems. Often we are modeling things with hexagonal cells, but that is not at all how real system looks like. They are more random in the deployment. Therefore, we use a more practical random-like deployment approximated by Poisson point processes where the base stations are located. What does that mean? Well, it means that we can have a variable, lambda, which is the number of base stations per square kilometer. And then when I'm generating my network, when I would like to put that base station in an area of a square kilometer, then I take lambda times a, that's the average number of base stations that should be in this area. I put it into a Poisson random number generator, and it gives me the number of base stations that should be there and then I just put them out uniformly at random in the area. In my analysis, I will have five optimization variables. The first one, M, 
is the number of antennas at the base station. The second one, k, is the number of users that are active at the same time per cell. Assuming that there are many, many users that would like to be active, so I can select this up to a certain number. The, last, uh, the third one is the transmit power, rho, or actually would be something proportional to the transmit power, but we will see that later. So that means that I can select on how strong power I will gonna transmit with. Next thing is the space station density that I mentioned. So with a lower density, you will have fewer cells in a certain area than at the higher density, at least on the average. And finally, something called the pilot reuse factor that says that in order to estimate my channel in the real system, if I have k uses in the cell, I need to have k pilot sequences or reference sequences that can be used to estimate the channels. And these can either be reused in every cell or in a fraction of the cells. And this pilot reuse factor tau is something between 1 and upwards that determines this reuse factor. And in my transmission, I will have frames of u channel uses, and I'm using path of them for pilots. That's tau times k, and the rest wait for data. And I would preferably like the data path to be large, but that also means that I will have to reuse the pilot sequences more often and that creates interference and worse channel estimates. Okay, so given these assumptions of the network and the optimization variables, the first thing you need to do is to figure out how the data throughput can be modeled as a function of these variables that we're having. And I'm not going to go into all the details on the derivations, but here is an example that we have. Data throughput is k, that's the number of multiplex users that are active. So we sum up the throughput for each one of them. We have this kind of prelog factor, 1 minus tau k divided by u. So this is the fraction of each frame that are used for data. Well, this is a fraction being used for pilots. And then we have the data throughput per user. It's a bandwidth times log 2 or 1 plus SINR. And SINR is an expression that is very long, depends on different parameters, and it can be derived in different ways in different setups. But the important thing is it depends on all the parameters that we were having. Some assumptions that I was using in order to derive this particular expression was I had a path logs exponent alpha, saying that the uh, power decays as a constant omega that says how much power I have at a certain reference distance times the distance in kilometers to the power of minus alpha. In free space propagation, alpha will be 2, but in reality it will be more like 3, 4. I used something called maximum ratio processing using MMSC channel estimation. Your details can be found in the papers. And we use power control for uniform service, meaning that I would like the signal to noise ratio for every user here to be the same. And so rho divided by B and not this was the noise variance will be the same for everyone on the average. So then we have model data throughput as a function of all the variables that we're having. We need to do the same thing with energy consumption. So the energy consumption will behave uh, differently depending on what hardware setup we're having. And usually you have to characterize it by a number of different variables. That will be constants. And then the rest of it will be based on your variables that you optimize. So here is the energy consumption that we were using. We have one part, depending on our different variables, that is the transmit power divided by the amplifier efficiency. Here we have the fixed circuit power. So this is something that will be consumed irrespective of if you have any users active or antennas on so essentially control signals and all of these kind of things. Then you had the power per transceiver chain. So something for every base station antenna that's turned on, something for every user antenna. Then we have something that has to do with the signal processing and it's proportional to the number of antennas and users. And finally, something that's proportional to data throughput. So it's the coding and decoding. Well, that number of bits is determined by this and also everything that has to be sent on the back call or other types of connections will also consume power in this particular way. And the important thing here is that this model is very general, but it depends on the number of variables. U, 
C0, C0, C01, C10, C11, and A. And these ones will change with time, naturally, as we design better, better hardware. But the model itself will always be true. So in order to run simulations, we had to select certain numbers for these parameter values. So the frame length, we put it to 400 channel users, the bandwidth 20 megahertz, path loss exponent of alpha of 3.76, the noise over path loss of one kilometer is 33 dBm, amplifier efficiency 0.39, and then some different values for the static power, for the circuit power per active user and for base station antennas, single processing coefficient and coding decoding back home. Particular numbers. And what kind of different opinions about which numbers that one should use here. And that's the reason why we have been putting all our code on GitHub. So one can generalize this or put in other numbers into this model and rerun and see how the plots can look like. But my claim is that the general behaviors will always stay true and the models will always be true. So the first thing is to look now at what happens when you densify your networks, cell densification. And I'm considering different base station densities over here. Here I have energy efficiency and all other variables are optimized except the base station density. However, I have decided that the SI naught that will deliver to my user is something that I have fixed. So that I have one network here that gives an SI naught of one on the average, one of three and one other here of seven. And these numbers are of course selected to get one bit per second per hertz, two bits per second per hertz, or three bits per second per hertz uh, as spectral efficiency. And you can multiply that with the bandwidth to get the actual data throughput. What we can see here is that the energy efficiency goes up and up and up. Okay, why is that? Well, as the base station density increases, we can cut down the transmit power in order to reach the user, and eventually the transmit power will be negligible in the system. So it's only the hardware consumed power, the circuit power, that will matter, and then it doesn't improve anymore. So we can also see that as we reduce the SINR, we get higher performance. Uh, so smaller SINR is more energy efficient. And that's also the reason why we put an SINR constraint from the beginning here. However, what is interesting here is the point at which the energy efficiency starts to saturate. Saturates around here, 10 up to 100. And base station density of 10 base station per square kilometer, that means that you have 150 to 300 meters between the base stations. And that is already satisfied in urban scenarios today. Meaning that when we start to densify, we will very quickly come into this region up here. Okay, so assume now that we are in this region. What is the best values of our other parameters? Here we are focusing on the number of antennas and users. We have put the constraint SINR should be equal to 3. And I have optimized all the variables except M and K. So M was the number of base station antennas. K was the number of users. And we can see here how the energy efficiency changes. So that's the uh, vertical axis here. So if we have too few users compared to antennas, we get a very low performance. So we would like to have more antennas than users. That's very typical when you have a multi-antenna system. And then it goes up. And there is certain points here where we get the maximum energy efficiency. In this case, it's 89 antennas 10 users per cell, and you then get an energy efficiency of 10.3 megabits per joule. And this type of setup, where you, by the way, also have a pile three use factor of seven, this is what we really call a massive MIME system in the literature. So when we optimize for energy efficiency here, what did we get? Well, we got a massive MIME system with small cells. That is the optimal way of doing these things. The numbers that we are observing here is also 500 times larger than the systems of today. Doesn't mean that you can get exactly these numbers, but it's a ballpark number. There is large improvements, uh, orders of magnitude, that you can get in future 5G networks if you design networks in the right way. So why didn't we only get small cells in these optimized systems? 
Well, the small cells improve the signal-to-noise ratio because you get more received power for, uh, for the same transmitted power. But it doesn't improve the signal to interference in the noise ratio because as you get closer to your own base station, you also get closer to other base stations. In the type of models I'm using here, uh, it doesn't get worse either, but in reality, it can get worse if you have a more accurate type of models. However, massive MIMO improves the SINRs, particularly for use at the cell edge, because by directing the signal towards its users, you can get higher signal power there without causing more interference to others and, or getting more interference to your user. And in addition to that, the multiplexing ability, so you can serve many users at the same time in the base station, that essentially takes the circuit power and divides it between the users because the cost of having this base station can now be shared between 10 or 20 different users. So in that way, the system becomes more energy efficient. At the optimal solution, how does the energy consumption look like? Well, recall this model. We have neglected the transmit power. So we have these different factors. And this is the big, fat, uh, the big pie. And there are two paths that are dominating. One is the fixed power consumption of the base station. One is the power consumption of the base station transceivers, it's the thing that is proportioned to the number of antennas. And since we had 89 antennas at the optimal, it's not so, so strange that it's a large factor here. Knowing now that this is a dominant part, when we are designing new hardware, we should keep these parts in mind. Because how do we get an energy efficient system? Well, we would like all factors that contribute to our cost to be as equal as possible. There should be not be one particular limiting factor because then we can improve that one and make a large difference. So in a good design, no part will be particularly dominating. To wrap up, I would also like to mention four common misconceptions that appear in this area. The first misconception is that we can turn off inactive base station to save energy. And that is not really true. Because what happens when you turn off a base station? Well, you degrade your network coverage. No one close to that base station can no longer connect to that base station. And you can just say, well, they will connect to someone else. But there will always be users that could only connect to that base station. And a network operator will never want to do that. However, there is something called discontinuous transmissions. That is something that is okay, where you are, when you, uh, still sending out control signals when the base station is inactive, but it goes into micro sleeps all the time, so you don't have to be turned on when you should have transmitted data, but doesn't have any data to transmit. The second misconception is that statements like this that you can unfortunately find in papers. We normalize the bandwidth to B equal to 1 hertz and the noise power to 1 without loss of generality. And the thing is that, no, the noise power is the bandwidth times the noise power spectral density. If you set the bandwidth to a certain number, you have now restricted your system to only operate in that particular case. And one hertz is extremely much smaller than a real system will operate. So you will really have a loss of generality by doing such an assumption. All your numbers will be wrong, even if your analysis might make sense in the analytical part. And we can't really normalize anything, particularly not noise power, because when you deal with energy efficiency, it's not the normalized transmit power that goes into the expression, it's the actual transmit power. If you have a certain SINR and it's close to the base station or have the same SINR and it's far away from the base station, you will get very different energy efficiencies because you have to transmit with different powers to get that. Third factor is statements like the energy efficiency is measured in bit per joule per hertz. And this is something that you still see in many papers, many well-cited papers. And it makes no real sense because, yes, you can take the energy efficiency in the way that I have described it, divide it with the bandwidth, which is what they're essentially doing, and then you get something in bit per joule per hertz. However, that doesn't mean that you can take just any bandwidth number now and multiply with it. 
because it was only no the bandwidth that was used to compute the noise power that can be used. Finally, the radiated energy efficiency of massive MIMO goes to infinity as m grows. And people have been studying a lot the radiated energy efficiency in a number of different papers. And that doesn't really make much sense either. Why? Well, because the actual energy efficiency, which takes both the radiated power and the circuit power into account, it goes to zero as you had more antennas. Because the circuit power, well, it grows with the number of antennas in a affine way. So you will get very extreme different cases. And you can get the feeling that massive MIMO should operate at very low transmit powers to be energy efficient, which is never the case because of the circuit power being there. So, as a conclusion, we talked about designing energy efficient 5G networks. And the first step to make a system energy efficient is to densify it. Until the point where you have just a few hundred meters between the base stations. In that case, the transmit power starts to become a negligible part of the total consumed power in the system. And now it's the circuit power that matters. In that point, you would like to deploy massive MIMO instead, having many antennas at the base station to serve many users. And that many antennas can be used to suppress interference spatially, so you can improve the SINR for users without uh, causing more interference to other cells. And since you have many users at the multiplex, you can also share the circuit power cost between those ones and make the system even more energy efficient. So the optimal solution is a combination of small cells and massive MIMO. And this methodology for energy efficiency optimization that I've been describing can be applied in all types of, types of systems. My setup was actually an uplink setup, but the downlink will go in the same type of way. And you can also consider other variables, such as bandwidth or frequency bands that you're using and which hardware components that are used. Many different factors can be factored into this methodology. You just need to model your data throughput and energy consumption in such a way that they depend on these ones in an accurate way. So, to wrap up, if you would like to know more about Massive MIMO, you can check out the Massive MIMO blog where I'm one of the writers. You can check out previous webinars. For example, this massive MIME for 5G, how big can it get? And you can check out my book, Massive MIME Network, Spectral Efficiency, Energy and Hardware Efficiency. It's a 517 page book. We're covering all these things from the beginning. There's Matka lab code available so you can regenerate all our figures, for example. And you can contact me for a free PDF. Thank you.